Me da mucho gusto estar aquí en UCLA. Uh, mi nombre es Álvaro Huerta. Es un profesor en Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, estudié aquí en UCLA uh, y también en Berkeley. Uh, también escribo por uh, Progressive. Uh, y me, y es bueno tener mucha gente aquí, y familias y estudiantes y hasta niños. Yo sé que este va a ir a UCLA o a Cal Poly. Y uh, también quiero agradecer a, a todos los participantes de este evento. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Epstein, Dr. Cho Noriega, Mike Stone y toda la gente de Chicano Studies Research Center que, que nos dio la oportunidad de estar aquí para hablar con ustedes. Uh, my name is Alvaro Huerta, uh, Assistant Professor of Cal Poly Pomona and Urban Planning and Ethnic and Women's Studies. And before um, teaching at Cal Poly, I studied here at UCLA and also at UC Berkeley. So it gives me great pleasure to come back uh, to UCLA, uh, especially since now we have a, a winning football team, so that's uh, even better. Uh, so I'm spreading a rumor that the coach uh, is actually Mexican. His, his name is Jaime Mora, it's not, it's not Jim Mora. So help me spread that uh, message as, as part of my, uh, my movement here to, to bring justice to UCLA. <laughs> Today we're very uh, happy to be at Chicano Studies Research Center. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Rebecca Epstein for organizing this event, Dr. Chon Noriega for allowing us to be here, uh, Mike Stone for filming this event, and everybody else at the Chicano Studies Research Center, the best uh, research center as far as I'm concerned, uh, in the United States, because it does an excellent job of not only uh, conducting research, but also incorporating art and film, uh, dance and music, and, and, and a, an array of aspects that impact uh, Chicanos and, and Chicanos in the United States uh, and, and also throughout, uh, throughout Latin America. So today uh, the talk is based on uh, grassroots movement, uh, the Association of Latin American Gardeners. And today part of um, this presentation is to recognize uh, not only the people that study uh, issues such as these, but also people that participated. Uh, so we have, for example, Adrian Alvarez, he was uh, or is a president, co-founder of the Association of Latin American Gardeners. Uh, we have uh, Scott Cummings, a professor of law at UCLA, someone who studies public interest and community economic development, who is also a participant, assisted in the gardeners. Uh, we also have uh, Victor Naro, uh, UCLA Labor Center, who teaches uh, labor studies and also at the law school. Uh, he also has a legal uh, background. So if anybody has a parking ticket, you know who to see. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that being at UCLA is, is a great institution and we want to expand the opportunities uh, for all people of color uh, in disenfranchised communities, not only so they can conduct research for research sake, but so they can conduct research to make uh, positive changes in society. Uh, and this is what it's all about today. So today's presentation partly is based on this article that I wrote in Aslan. Uh, this is the publication of the Chicano Studies Research Center. Ever since they published me, it has become a premier uh, journal article. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it is also you know, something that has uh, started in the early uh, 1970s. Uh, one of the co-founders was uh, Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones of the History Department who will also join us today to talk about uh, the Association of Latin American Gardeners in, um, at about four o'clock once this class is done. So there's uh, an array of people that are co-sponsored this event. I'm not gonna read the list, uh, it's just too many, uh, but they're right here. Uh, and some of them were gracious enough to uh, sponsor food for us. So we're gonna have carnitas, uh, mojo de ajo, and I'm just kidding. So we're going to have some appetizers um, after the event is done. So before uh, we we have the speakers talk about their perspectives, their viewpoints, uh, not only as people that believe in, in justice, but people that uh, have been academics and professionals in, in different areas. Uh, you know, I want to discuss a little bit about the give some background information about what this campaign was all about. And with that, uh, they can not necessarily comment on the presentation, but when, when they comment, it'll make a little bit more sense uh, because you'll see that while we always talk about 
when we talk about social movements, we always talk about the United Farm Workers and organizations like that. There have been hundreds of hundreds of movements uh, in the United States led by Chicanos, Chicanas, Latinos, and Latinas that haven't been recognized. Uh, so part of this effort is to show the diversity of movements that have been taking place and shed light on one of the most dynamic uh, movements uh, in the United States and having to do with organizing gardeners. Uh, I must say that I'm, at full disclosure, uh, prior to becoming an academic, I also participated in co-founding uh, the Association of Latin American Gardeners. So this is something that is, I'm um, viewing this not just an academic, but also from as a former organizer or somebody who organizes and has that insider outsider uh, perspective. So part of the research question here is, how is it that a small group of gardeners is able to successfully challenge uh, the Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, the second largest uh, city in the United States, a very powerful uh, institution. In 1996, they passed a, a ban to, to uh, a law to ban leaf blowers. So there's a few uh, findings, uh, and one of the, and to take one at a time, one of the success, one of the reasons why they were successful is because these gardeners, uh, mainly uh, Mexican immigrants and, and some South, uh, Central Americans, were very successful in forging a relationship uh, with uh, Chicano and Chicana activists. So this is a, this combination of having the workers, uh, people that bring the discipline, people that bring the experience, and also in combining with with activists that have that studied history at UCLA, that studied theory that have engaged in movements about the undocumented before it has become something that, that is very popular. Uh, th these individuals struggled for the rights of immigrant undocumented students at, a, at UCLA uh, to defend their interests in terms of financial aid and other services. So we see that one of the, the other findings is that this, this movement represents a very dynamic grassroots movement uh, in, in the United States. And this is not led just by immigrants, but also the children of immigrants. So the Chicanos and Chicanas that were involved in this, they themselves are part of that community. So they're not outsiders coming in. They themselves are either immigrants or children of immigrants uh, of these workers. So this relationship between, it's in a sense like between the parent and the child and, and coming together and bringing you know, both worlds together. And what's important here is that they did so in a very democratic fashion, in, in a way, in it's in its, its horizontal. So the relationship is not as the someone that went to UCLA, for example, I'm better than someone like my parents who, who didn't go to school in Michoacan because they went to UCLA and they didn't. It wasn't that type of relationship. Because a lot of times with, with Mexican immigrants, like my parents and others, the first thing they'll say is, yo no sé nada, tu dime que hacer. Like, I don't know what to do, you, you tell me you tell me what to do. Or in the case of a lot of us that were you know, children of immigrants, when we're 10 years old, we're, we're translating for our parents uh, in, in important issues, whether it's um, education, in the medical, uh, in very important uh, issues. Too many organizations, uh, for example, we see the, the Justice for Janitors, SEIU, they, they talk about grassroots movements and they have a presentation. It looks like the grassroots movement, but they're not. It's a very hierarchical organization, it's a top-down, it's more, more like a business model where the people on top are telling the people on the bottom what to do. And while the pictures, everybody looks, you see the immigrants in the front, the people making the decisions are not the immigrants, people from the down dictated. So this is a different movement. This is, in essence, what Cesar Chavez and the, and the farm workers, Dolores Huerta, what they started in the beginning. Where it's, it's more democratic, it's people coming together and making decisions. Another part of what, why was, this was very effective, and I'll talk a little bit about the gardeners themselves and the movement, is because the gardeners utilize their, their networks, their, their family networks, uh, to help organize. And this was something that is very uh, fascinating. The leaders, gardeners represent not only workers, but also petty entrepreneurs. So they're, they're, they don't just work, they own the, the business itself. So they're small business men. And when you don't know anything about them, you assume that they're all independent, they're all just working by themselves. 
and a lot of times in history and movies we see this romantic way of how movements start and they really don't start that way this actual movement that I'll describe a little bit more detail started with Jaime Alemán a Mexican immigrant who married Leticia Sanchez who graduated from UCLA Leticia Sanchez happens to be her dad was a gardener uh, Jaime became a gardener thanks to the father Jaime has cousins and brothers and sister brothers that are gardeners and Jaime knew uh, Adrián Álvarez knew uh, knew this uh, handsome guy named Álvaro Huerta and, and others and at a party while we were drinking and, and talking about Julio Cesar Chavez and how he beat up a Medrick Taylor that's when he brought up this issue of the leap lord said if you guys believe in, in justice why don't you help us the Mexicans about they want to take away our leap lord and at the time, I grew up in housing projects. I had no idea what a leap roar was. You know, we didn't have lawns back, back then. And so our, our intuition was, how do we start? How do you organize a group that has never been organized? Because organizing janitors, my father was a janitor, and, and people like that is, is relatively easy because they're all in one place. But how do you organize people that are all over, like domestic workers, like my mother? That, you know, you have one here, you have one there, one over there. So it's very, very difficult. So we started by intuition with Jaime's family networks, his cousins, his friends, his paisanos, people that, that hail not just from Mexico, but from Zacateca, not just from Zacateca, but from Jerez, Zacateca. And we started at this one building, and what we realized it was just, it was amazing. We visited one apartment, and because of the networks, we started with five. And then we went back a week later, and then there was 20. And before you know, we were meeting with 50 people from Zacatecas in that same apartment. And this is how these migrant networks work. They operate. Right? People, the relationships, there's these ties, these strong ties among, among immigrants from, from the countryside or the city to, to the present. So these, these networks were very important in organizing the gardeners. And part of that organization in, in organizing gardeners had to do also with what we say in Spanish is confianza. So how do you get confianza? How do you get trust? And it's through the relationship through Jaime, uh, being a gardener, being from Zacatecas, being an immigrant, and having these relationships with his cousins, with his, with his uh, you know, paisanos, with his employees, that people come together because they trust Jaime. And then Jaime introduces us as organizers you know, to them, and then it's, it's like the mafia, you know, he's a friend of ours. And you see that allows, you start to build relationships that way. And this is how organizing works. This is how grassroots organizing works. It works by building trust, you know, step by step, you know, brick by brick. And without that trust, without that confianza, you're not, you don't have anything. You just have people dictating to people what to do, like, like herding sheep, like, with the justice for genders, what they do. So for me, it's important that we look at organizing and differentiate and see models so that other people you know, can, learn, can learn from them. In 1990, well, a few years ago, 2006, uh, I was at the airport, I was gonna talk, give a talk, and I was just thinking about the gardeners, I was going to Ithaca, actually, to Cornell, and, and I was wondering, I was a little bit lost and thinking, oh, they don't, I don't know if they've seen a Mexican in, 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 uh, in Ithaca yet. And I got a little nervous because not even the, the cleaning people were Mexicans. Like even I was like, oh my god. And I was talking. About, I was going to talk about this. I was going to talk about this project about researchers looking at gardeners, looking at immigrants, looking at Latinos, and nobody has written about this before. And then right there, right in front of me in the in the new in the newsstands. I mean, it's like the Aztec gods are following me from East LA to to Ithaca. Right in front of me on the front page of Time Magazine is a Mexican gardener. The problem, I forgot the magazine in my hotel, so I couldn't even talk about it, but... Mario Correa from Michoacán, he, over 20 years ago, he was in Mexico, and uh, an American tourist invited him to go to the Hamptons to help him in the yard. Actually, it was about 30 years ago from now, and 30 years later, he established a, gar a route. He brought his cousins, he, his, father, his, his parents, his friends, 
and through the migrant networks, now you have like over 500 people from the same town that is from in Michoacán working in, in the Hamptons as gardeners, as domestic workers, and doing this important work. So it's, it's amazing how, how these networks work, how they bring people together through, through time and space. So this, this labor niche, well, what are we talking about when we're looking at gardeners? You know, we know a lot about uh, janitors and, and other industries, but there's little research that we know about gardeners. Uh, so it's, it's, very, it's understudied, and it's, we're looking at an ethnic uh, labor niche in the informal economy. So the informal economy is what's not regulated, it's where the you know, people operate, it's a cash-based, and there's no regulations in terms of the, the state. Over 100 years ago, the Japanese, um, actually in the late 1800s, they established a gardening uh, in Northern California. So for over 100 years before the Mexicans, uh, Mexican immigrants dominated this industry, the Japanese were the ones that were the gardeners in, in California and beyond. So this, this was important because they, 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 they passed the torch. In the early 1900s, the United States or California passed a law that prohibited uh, Japanese from owning, Japanese immigrants from owning uh, farmland because they were very, com they were out competing the white farmers. And one, in response, the Japanese, they went, they went into gardening. So they started doing gardening in, in the city. And then even when after they came back from the camps, after World War II, then they, were, they kept doing this gardening. Uh, and throughout this period, throughout the 1900s, even from the 1920s, they were recruiting Mexicans to help work for them. And one of them in the 1960s actually was my father-in-law. So they, they started to recruit these, these workers. And as the children, the grandchildren of the Japanese immigrants, started to retire and their children started to go on to the universities like UCLA, UC Berkeley, the Mexican immigrants slowly started to take in on those positions. So they started to branch out only um, uh, landscape nurseries, but the ones that slowly but surely, by the 1980s, you know, the Mexican immigrants started to own all of these businesses because the Japanese were, were aging and their children were not, were not part of the industry. So it's a, it's a very precarious and vulnerable sector. The drought, for example, is impacting gardeners tremendously. Uh, you know, the governor is forcing everyone to cut the uh, water consumption by so much percent, and the, the lawns are the first ones that are being hit. Right, so now, before people would water the lawn every day, now it's like once a week if they're lucky. And, and now when they're stripping the, the lawns, you know, the, the gardeners have less work, because right, they, they don't have that. The, necess the, the homeowner doesn't have the necessity to have someone to maintain their lots. Also, a lot of the homeowners don't pay them, so they work for a few months and they don't pay them. Um, and it's hard for them to try to get that money back because they have to go to small claims. Uh, their, their, their equipment is stolen. A lot when they park their cars and they're working in the backyard, you know, people see and they, they steal their equipment. Uh, there's, there's limited labor protections. Uh, they were, we're talking about child labor here and um, no minimum wage. The, the conditions that they work under are the same conditions that workers, uh, organizers here in the mid-1900s, mid in the 1850s, were organizing for, in terms of minimum wage, uh, you know, working five days a week, and things of that nature. So uh, over 150 years later, Im Mexican immigrants, gardeners, are still working in the same conditions that were being fought uh, you know, decades ago. So we, if we look at the demographics, this is primarily a, a gender niche is male. Right? We're looking at Latinos and uh, in, in the areas where Latinos um, are concentrated. And now Latinos can be found anywhere. I mean, you know, it's not just the, the Southwest. Uh, you know, we're, we're in Arkansas, in North Dakota, Alaska. Uh, you know, Mexicans are, can be found in anywhere throughout the throughout the country. New York is a major um, Mexican uh, population. Chicago. So. Jardineros, we're looking at males, Latinos. So it's a gender niche. You rarely see a, wo a woman working, just like domestic workers. So domestic workers, female, is Latinas. In Los Angeles, we're looking primarily Mexican immigrant uh, from the countryside. So you're not gonna have a Chilango or someone from, from Tijuana, from La Libertad, Colonia, you know, working as a, uh, as a jardinero, because they're not accustomed to that. So a lot of people that, just like the first Japanese that came over in the late 
1800s, early 1900s, they, they were farmers in their country, so when they came to the United States and they, they got into uh, to gardening, it was an easy trans transition for them. They're working with nature, working with plants, and, they're, uh, and something they like, because they work outdoors versus indoors, and so on and so forth. So a, a lot of them were looking at Michoacán, Zacatecas, Jalisco, Durango. Uh, if you go like Northern California, certain areas where there's a high concentration of, of people from Michoacán, then, then like Palo Alto, for example, Redwood City, uh, they're there, so it depends on the area. Uh, if you go to Houston, where there's a, a lot of Guatemaltecos, then those individuals, you'll have um, you know, people from, from Guatemala and in other places where it's a lot of Sal Salvadorian concentration, then, then you'll have that. So it's limited English skills. There's a, not all of them are undocumented, but you have some, some that are, so there's, there's a mix. Uh, a lot of them benefited from IRCA in terms of amnesty in, in, in getting the citizenship, but a lot of the workers you know, may or may not have their, their documentation. And that's something on an ethical basis to study. I don't, I don't want to give ICE and the government information of what, where, where are people that are undocumented. I think it's unethical to do those type of studies. Uh, it's like, look over here, you know, 90% are undocumented. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, there's, that's not even an issue. So there's the right to the front lawn. This is something, uh, it's a painting my brother, Salmon Huerta. Um, paint it so if anybody's inter interested in art, let me know, give you a discount. The gardeners, where do they work? They work in the front lawn. And what's amazing to me, what's amazing to me is that they fought a campaign about having the right to use a leaf blower in private property, in land that they don't even own. I mean, think about it. It's not like the day laborers who, who fight on the corner. That's public, right? The street court, that's a public. So the gardeners have the audacity, you know, looking at it in a good way, the audacity to fight to use the leaf blower on private property, on somebody else's land. And because they have a relationship with the employer, a lot of times that relationship is they've known them for 10, 15, 20 years. The, the employer, so there was a lot of employers that, that, that supported the gardeners. Not like they got a raise, but there was you know, the relationship there. Mm -hmm. So it's just a few facts before I, I, I pass it to uh, we'll start with, with Victor. So in, in, on December 1996, uh, the city of Los Angeles, the city council passed a leaf blower ban. If you, if you were caught using a leaf blower 500 feet within the residential area in Los Angeles, misdemeanor charge, $1,000 fine, and six months in jail. Welcome to Los Angeles. So as I spoke about migrant networks, the migrant networks were effective in organizing the gardeners. That's where we started and that's where we ended. And to be completely honest, a lot of the organizing doesn't even take place in the meeting. You know, like Victor was working at Chile at the time. A lot of times it takes place in bars, and places like that. Right, in cantinas and restaurants and other places that I can't say because we're being videotaped, but. Is my wife here? Yeah. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is that it becomes, it doesn't become a political thing, it becomes social, it becomes family. Right, so you're talking about organizing gardeners at a quinceanera, you know, uh, you know, somebody's a glue for the Zacatecas, they're selling tickets and we go, we, we're talking about organizing. So it's all in, in embedded communities. And this is important because in Mexico and any other country, well not any other country, but most countries like in Mexico, where at the time the PRI dominated for decades, Right, uh, the, the conservative reactionary Vargas Llosa called the the, the PRI the perfect dictatorship. The Mexicans have a distrust for government and have a distrust for people that say, "I'm here to help you." So when you have people that uh, are educated, that were either born here or assimilated, to come to a community and say, "I'm here to help you," they initially there is a distrust, right? Because there's like, "Okay, I've heard that story before." But when you're introduced, when you're, you're embedded with, with other jardineros and they bring you in and you slowly work your way in, uh, th then it, it facilitates that process. So I won't get too much into this, but the framing of the, well, this was very important. The, the way the affluent people, uh, residents, we're looking at West LA, Beverly Hills, Pacific Valley, they, they argued it was a public nuisance. We're talking about noise, uh, Pseudo environmentalists about noise and pollution. So that was their argument, and that influenced the city council nine to three to vote uh, for the the leaf blower ban. 
what was, the, what was brilliant about the Gardners is that they reframed the argument. They didn't even argue what they were arguing. Because when, when you argue with an argument, when you argue within a frame, then you, you're just a losing proposition. So if you want to read more about frames, look at George Lakoff at UC Berkeley. He talks about how like, conservatives are more effective than, than Democrats or progressive in framing argument. So instead of looking at this as a public issue, the jardineros, with the help of, of the, the Chicano activists, looked at this as we're looking at uh, hardworking individuals. Uh, and they argued issues of race, class, immigration, and also technology. So they made it a class of, of uh, the rich versus the poor. Affluent whites from the west side picking on the working class Latino immigrants. City hall you know, picking on the little guy. And that resonates with a lot of people. And then also they, the, the band wanted people to use a, a a broom, for example, or a rake. So it, it was a question of technology. So the organizers, they were brilliant. They were talking about uh, sending the, the rover to Mars and, and technology and everything that we do in this country. But when it comes to gardeners, we want to take them back to the 1800s, right? So don't they have a right to technology too? So this is uh, wrapping it up. Well, another brilliant idea that uh, actually Adrian Alvarez, who's here present, he, um, he had the brilliant idea of using uh, images, so he designed his images and using baseball hats and using uniforms. So to create an identity, to create solidarity, uniformity, uh, the gardeners. So when we have protests of 500, 1,000 gardeners, everybody was wearing a green hat, everybody was wearing a, a, a green shirt and a jacket. And you, you see this in other campaigns, you know, just as janitor and stuff the UFW, and it's very effective. The imagery is, is amazing. But where the racism comes into play, the first thing that the residents from the Pacific Palisades and Beverly Hills, actually all of UCLA's neighbors, let's just put it that way. The first thing they said was, wow, the gardeners are in the pocket of the manufacturers, the leaf blower manufacturers, because they can't afford the, the baseball hats. So they, they must be like, somebody's telling them what to do. So just a few protests. Uh, one of the, what the gardeners did, or like they took it to the streets and took it to city hall. They protested. They marched bare, barefoot uh, on November 4, 1997. They took uh, brooms and bicycles to the city council members. So they told the city council members at the time they were because they were saying that they were environmentalists, but they were driving SUVs that the city uh, issued to them. So we gave them bikes and say, if you're a true environmentalist, why don't you take this bike to work? We forced, eventually forced the city to recognize the Dia del Jardinero. Uh, we had a, a caravan to Sacramento. So it was a, a lot of uh, a beautiful and very effective um, organizing. So there's this idea, you can't beat City Hall. But the gardeners, the Jardineros, prove that you can't beat City Hall. You can beat it. It takes a lot of heart, a lot of heart, a lot of work, a lot of dedication, a lot of brains, a lot of passion and commitment to social justice to beat City Hall. And on um, December 17, 1997, the City Council voted 96 to remove the, the draconian measures, which was a misdemeanor, $1,000 fine, six months in jail, and replaced it with a citation and, and $270 fine. Once you pass a law in City Hall or anywhere, it's almost impossible to change that law. It's very, very difficult. And the gardeners were able to do it. They, they didn't do away with it completely, but they were able to force the city to do that. Two more slides. The Huelga de Hambre, even though the city council, re Alagla forced the city council to change the, their law, for the gardeners, it wasn't gooder. So they wanted more. They wanted the whole thing banned. The whole law was scrapped. And so led by Adrian, uh, actually, I wasn't in the hunger strike because I get dizzy from lunch to dinner. So, <laughs> you know, so you know, I have to excuse myself there. Um, from, that, from January 3rd, 1998 to January 10th, the gardeners about 11 to 12 gardeners waged a hunger strike, uh, as I'm being the, the, 
the leader of that, uh, to force the city to do away with the ban altogether, do away with the law. So there was a lot of negotiations, a lot of back and forth. Uh, you even have a surreal situation where the gardeners met with the mayor. They literally met with the mayor, at the time it was Mayor Reardon, three times. That was the most anybody had met with the mayor within a short time period. And the third time he was eating a hamburger while the hunger strikers you know, were, were meeting with them. So the gardeners wanted to push, push, continue to push the envelope. Eventually there was some technology changes that the gardeners changed the, the, the equipment to methanol so it, it, it had a loophole in the law so the law is really ineffective. So this, uh, this whole presentation, this conference is dedicated to memory of uh, Salvador Hernandez Lira. He was one of the gardeners of the Jardineros of, at the time. Uh, so we'll stop there and um, you know, we'll give it, give it to the speakers. Very much. I, uh, my name is Victor Nadro. I work at the UCLA Labor Center. Uh, I first want to thank the Chicano's, uh, you know, Chicano's uh, Service Resource Center. I, I've been here before to do presentations. That was great coming back to this space, and it is a uh, great um, service to the university, to UCLA, that this service, uh, this um, resource center does, and I really have a lot of great history with it. Um, I teach at uh, the Community Scholars Program at the UCLA Downtown Labor Center. It's great to see some of my students here from uh, Community Scholars. If they're late today, I know why they're gonna be late for class later. Um, and I do have to leave around between 4.35 o'clock because I need to make my way back to the Downtown Labor Center um, to do the Community Scholars class. I wanna talk about my connection with this campaign and the individuals here with us today. You know. Um, I've been doing social justice work for 30 years now, over 30 years. I think my first campaign really started in 1984, um, that I can remember. And <clears throat> I just think this campaign, um, the Association of Latin American Gardeners, that campaign against the Lee Florida Ordinance, which really stands out as uh, one of my, um, the campaign that defines for me the essence of community organizing. And, you know, um, I continue the relationship with Adrian and Alvaro in many different ways, and I, I live in Sherman Oaks now, and literally one month ago I was out there jogging, I'm a long distance runner, and I was jogging in the higher elevations of Sherman Oaks, and I ran into a couple of the members of Alvaro, and they called me out, and I stopped running and I had a, a nice dialogue with them, but I still see them, I still connected with them and this movement. Uh, my connection with this movement really uh, was it when I was at the Coalition for Humane and Human Rights of Los Angeles, I started there in 1996. I had previously met with these folks when I was at the Mexican American Legal Defense Educational Fund. They didn't quite understand back then what um, the issue was. Um, unfortunately, Margaret decided not to pursue this case, but when I, when they found out I was at Chilla, they followed me to Chilla and met with me and engaged me more deeply about this issue. Back then in, 19, in the 1990s, uh, there were new alternative models of organizing. Chilla's role was really uh, to organize day laborers and domestic workers. Um, but there were other worker centers emerging at, at, at that time, the Korean Italian Immigrant Workers Alliance, started in 1992. And there were others. And I think um, it was a response to what was happening along the same time with the labor movement. I mean, the labor movement, we know the past 20 years has been a major decline in this country. So they had these new models of organizing immigrant workers. And I always think Alaga needs to be documented more as an example of really a, these kind of alternative organizing models. Because I think it, it's, it was an organic movement, but it was very well organized. And there was a great structure. And it was very democratic. So when I met with them when I was at Chula, um, I decided to jump in and try to help them in any way possible, more than just offer an office space. To me, that was the easy thing to do, but I really wanted to see how Chile as an immigrant rights organization could get more involved with this campaign. Um, it wasn't until I really got involved in helping them that I started getting the backlash from the actors and actresses. I know there was Catwoman, Julie Newmark, yeah. and Peter Gray's Mission Impossible. They were leading the charge, and they were living in Buenavue at the time. Um, I got the hate messages from them when they when I did a little or uh, open letter supporting the efforts of the gardeners. Um, 
they accuse me of being an anti-environmentalist. Um, I did not see this as an environmental issue. I just thought this as a workers' rights issue. And Adrian educated me about what a leaf blower means for a gardener. I mean, without the leaf blower, they cannot be able to do the level of work they need to survive, to eat, survive economically. And that's what a leaf blower meant for them. It was taking away their livelihood. Um, Council Member Mike Hernandez, I think, saw it that way. I think he was the only one in the city council that I think really saw this as a workers' rights issue and tried to champion uh, their cause. I recently went to his retirement party, and he mentioned in his retirement party he mentioned this campaign as one of the highlights of his career. Really? Yeah, because um, I think this really stood out for him. I think he really did all he can to fight for the rights of um, the gardeners against the leaf blower ordinance. Um, I remember the Barefoot March. You know, I remember walking barefoot. <laughs> Those few miles. I was very moved by the hunger strike. The LA Times that year um, declared this as one of the highlights for the year. I remember that they came out with a piece at the end of the year in 1998. They declared this campaign as one of the highlights uh, for the year. Um, and I just think that uh, we need to document this movement. I, I recall, I, I, I think that taught me a lot about organizing, organizing immigrants. I remember the meetings at Griffith Park, the extension, and it became a family uh, extension, a family networks. And I remember the holiday parties became a great source of organizing. Um, the Dia de los Honeyderos was really a great accomplishment because then they had a day where they can recognize each other, but they did great events to bring in more um, connectable, more, more with gardeners and their allies. Um, and then, I would, you know, uh, I just think this campaign highlights for me the um, the connection between grassroots organizing, advocacy, and um, alliance building. And it was through this campaign that I really got to deepen my relationship with Scott Cummins, you know, because we, we called on him many times, especially for the resources that he has at the law school. They created a limited liability corporation, so, so there, there is, uh, in the lab, there's an OLC and over the years have engaged in different kinds of uh, economic development projects to help support the gardeners. Um, we created a Statue of Liberty project, you know, that was a, another attempt to, to create a civic engagement project to help gardeners and to bring in resources to help them um, as they continue the struggles. And then, um, uh, you know, we, we continue to find ways to support the, the uh, Association of Latin American Gardeners. I think that these campaigns, these kind of movements, the challenge is when you have a campaign that defines a movement and then you're successful in the campaign. It, sustainability is hard for these movements. And I think that's been one of the challenges. I think it's great to see Adrian, Alvaro, Jaime, Aleman, and others are very committed to continuing the struggle. <clears throat> My role, I think, is to document it more. I think I need to document it more in the context of the literature that I've been creating about worker centers and alternative models of organizing. I just think this campaign needs more attention because it's it's a good model for um, activism. It's a good model for um, people who want to look at different strategic types of organizing models to create change. So I want to thank them for bringing me back here. I feel like this is a reunion. <laughs> many ways, but I, uh, I'm committed to this movement, I always have, um, and I think, I feel proud that one of the first decisions I made at Chile was, in addition to the great work they were doing with organizing the movement with their laborers and domestic workers, that I decided to jump in and help out as many, in any way possible to get Chile involved in this movement, so thank you very much. Actually, you, you've got a jacket, right? Yeah, oh. and I got my cap still. So, so in, this is like being baptized. Victor was a member. He, he was a, he became, it wasn't, there was a point where it wasn't about helping a lagla, he was a lagla, he was part of it. I mean, that, that, it kind of works that way. Um, in, in terms of, of being involved and, and getting in and being welcomed that way, like being accepted. Um, unfortunately for Victor, everybody kept calling him, they have all these issues. They were asking him for help with domestic uh, issues and all, and all kinds of, so ne don't say you're a lawyer next time you uh, you go to a meeting. Uh, but Victor is, he, 
unfortunately, I wasn't able to thank everybody or recognize everybody in, in this article, but in, in the book that um, maybe uh, Dan and Victor and Scott, we can bring together, write some, something in, as an anthology or a book about this as a model to recognize everybody who, who was instrumental in helping. I'm glad Victor mentioned Maldiv. You know, we hear about Maldiv being a great organization, but when the Lagla, as a leadership, when we approached Maldiv, they said no. Really, Thomas talks about social justice, and he's a con uh, county board of supervisor. Back then, he was a city council member. When we approached him at the city council member with Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones, who accompanied us, he said no, he, he wasn't going to help us. It wasn't in his radar. So a lot of people that are progressive, they talk about a good game. When it, when it comes down to it, they're, they're, it's, just, it's about the self-interest. Jackie Goldberg, another person that went to Berkeley, the free speech movement, the so-called progressive, when it came to the Jardineros, she said no. Actually, she was very antagonistic towards us. And for the record, Mike Hernandez was actually in favor, initially voted in favor of the, like, along with uh, Alarcón, Richard Alarcón, voted, two Latinos voted in favor of the Liquor ban. It wasn't until we pressured him and threatened to, voy uh, to veto him that uh, Mike Hernandez came our way. And he actually came our way in a good way. You know, it, he did, he was a strong advocate, but you know, I think he forgot a little bit. He forgot that to mention that part. Well, he started blowing, but not with the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I mean. And Ed Reyes, was, he was the chief of staff at the time. So there's just all these relationships. It gets a little tricky, but at the end of the day, it, it's important to know, like, who, who are your friends? Like when it comes down to it, like when, when someone is in need, like who is there to help a good cause? Okay, Scott Cummings, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a dance speak. So thank you all for being here. I am a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and uh, my frame for all this is to think about how law can be used as a tool for advancing uh, economic justice, generally in immigrant organizing in particular. So I teach at the law school, I teach a clinic in community development that really focuses on supporting community organize, organizing groups and organizations more generally to really build power both, both in the economic and the political realm um, and to promote strategies for creating economic security. I also do a lot of thinking and writing about the role of law and lawyers and social movements generally and particularly thinking about the role of law and lawyers in uh, the immigrant rights and labor movement here in Los Angeles. So I'm really thrilled to be here and to really think about the Gardner struggle as one of the seminal points in I think the broader movement and the overall fight for immigrant rights and economic justice in LA uh, because I do think it played such a foundational role in the overall uh, uh, movement uh, in the field. Um, so I want to spend just a short amount of time doing two major things. I want us to reflect on the role of law and lawyers in the Gardner's uh, struggle and to think about sort of lessons that I learned by my participation in the struggle and then reflecting back on it uh, today when I was thinking about preparing for this panel um, in terms of what it's taught me about the effective uses of law as a tool of social justice. Um, law in the campaign, of course, started out as a source of oppression, right? The leaf blower ban took away the gardener's ability to earn a living. But then law was also mobilized in really productive ways in favor of change in a matter that I think are important and have uh, important connections to other movements. And so I want to say a little bit about the lessons from the campaign, again, for me as a lawyer, and thinking about how lawyers can best work with and support immigrant organizing. And then I want to step back a little bit and just raise some questions about the campaign um, and its legacy for workers' rights in Los Angeles. So again, first I want to start by thanking um, Alvaro Huerta and Adrián and Victor. They really gave me my start as a baby lawyer. When I started practicing fresh out of law school, I didn't have gray hair, um, but I went to work with these guys, um, and they gave me the opportunity to work on a really profound, meaningful, and important social justice campaign, and it was really transformative because it gave me a window into what I could do as a lawyer to really advance meaningful and enduring change in Los Angeles, so I'm eternally grateful to all of them for that opportunity. Um, I got to work with Gardner's uh, to think through on the back end of this campaign really how to capitalize on the organizing success that Alvaro uh, set out in the beginning to create a permanent organization, uh, a, a, a worker-owned uh, business, a cooperative, that, and that experience was really formative for me in thinking about how to relate to grassroots organizing as a lawyer. Um, so let me start by just uh, talking about a few lessons from the campaign uh, uh, about how law matters in, in immigrant worker movements. Again, I spent uh, the day to day sort of reflecting back, reading back through the uh, literature on the campaign, 
And I wanted just to note some of the points of legal intervention and highlight their impact uh, and draw some comparisons with other movements in LA I think as relevant. So one of the first lessons that I took away from uh, thinking back about this is that a bad law can really act as a spur to positive community organizing over time. So of course no one wants a bad law to start out with, um, but there is a rich history on both the left and the right of the political spectrum of laws being passed or created by courts that injure movements in the short term, but then spark a mobilization that makes a movement grow stronger in the long term. And the, uh, the uh, leaf blower ban's enactment in December of 1996 really galvanized activists um, uh, and the larger gardener community. Before this time, I, I think as uh, Alvaro suggested, the gardeners were more fragmented and politically disempowered, but after the law passed, uh, they really coalesced and gained real power, uh, so much so as to negate the impact of the law. Um, and moreover, once they formed, I think uh, they were able to continue to organize for a collective economic gain in ways that really transcended uh, the campaign. So the, the lesson that uh, came home for me in thinking about this campaign was sort of how to turn legal setbacks into opportunity for positive change. Um, and I think that there's a lot of uh, resonance with lessons in the historical record. There are many historical examples. Um, on, on the right, um, we can think about um, um, uh, sort of bad examples like conservative counter-mobilization in the South after Brown versus Board of Education that really rescinded uh, the gains of that particular legal decision. And we can think about uh, positive examples on the left, things like the striking organizing success of the LGBT, LGBT movement um, after the really bad legal decision in Bowers versus Hardwick, uh, which affirmed uh, anti the state anti-sodomy laws in 1986. Um, in Los Angeles, I think, I think we can also draw some important parallels. Uh, I think of the day labor movement, which was launched in part, and I, this has already been alluded to, in response to the aggressive use by cities of anti-solicitation ordinance, which were premised on a very similar logic to the, to the, to the logic that was used here in the Gardner's context. Anti-solicitation ordinance said that, um, <clears throat> said that day laborers posed a public nuisance by congregating on street corners, seeking work, and, in, and cities therefore imposed outright bans um, on their solicitation of employment. So Glendale passed an anti-solicitation ordinance in 1988 that led to the creation of Churla's day labor outreach program, and so sort of the negative law created positive um, organizing effects. Um, and then it was the proliferation of anti-solicitation ordinances um, up into the 2000s, there were about 40 by 2000, that really contributed to lawsuits and organizing drives that ended up culminating in the creation of the National Day Labor Organizing Network. So, so both in the Gardner's campaign, I think, and then also in other campaigns in Los Angeles and beyond, uh, we see the powerful mobilizing effect of bad laws and the ability of movements to take advantage of the opportunity that are presented by bad laws to really uh, uh, create resources, galvanize support, and move forward in positive ways. Um, this leads to the second lesson, which is that lawsuits, litigation, uh, filing suits in court may help a movement by clearing away bad laws, um, or when they can't do that, by helping to raise costs uh, to city enforcement and reframe laws as punitive or contrary to important values like work. Uh, so in the Garner's case, uh, th this wasn't mentioned, I think, in Alvaro's presentation, but lawyers um, uh, filed a lawsuit to invalidate uh, the leaf blower ban um, on, on due process and equal protection grounds. And the basic idea was that there were a bunch of other noisy tools that uh, gardeners uh, use, including lawnmowers, that were permitted so long as they were used within certain hours. But here we had this outright ban on leaf blowers that were really targeted to a specific group, Latino immigrant uh, gardeners, who were therefore could not engage in productive work at all, and therefore it violated their right to the equal protection of laws. Now, this lawsuit ended up failing However, it did um, play an important role within the campaign because it put the city on alert that the gardeners were serious. Um, it helped with organizing to open up uh, the doors of City Hall and it ultimately uh, produced uh, a positive re resolution. Again, I think uh, it's interesting to compare the day labor campaign where lawsuits also played a really key role in the movement, ultimately uh, proving successful in invalidating the most serious anti-solicitation bans on the ground that they infringe upon gay laborers' right to free speech, the right to stand on the corner and communicate with potential employers about work. Um, and these 
lawsuits uh, were, were, were instrumental in clearing away these anti-solicitation anti ordinances, or at least uh, the most uh, serious ones, or, or, or egregious ones, in ways that have created opportunities for day labor to get back to work at, in, in places where they were, they were banned from doing so. So day labor context litigation clears the way to work, in the gardener's context, I, see, I think we see it not as succeeding on the merits, but raising the cost to city for enforcement um, and raising public awareness about the issues in ways that led to similar results. So thir third lesson um, <clears throat> uh, that, that, I, that I reflected on in, in, in thinking about the, the gardener's movement today is that defending against uh, criminal prosecutions, criminal enforcement, can also be a very powerful way to advance the social movement's goals. So in the gardener's case, Lawyers were also successful in defending two gardeners that were prosecuted under the ordinance on the ground that the ordinance only applied to gas-powered leaf blowers and not to methanol-powered leaf blowers, which these two gardeners um, had used. And so they were using sort of clean burning fuel that was, uh, that was permitted under the ordinance according to the legal defense. Um, and the court agreed with, the, with, with this argument and uh, tossed out the prosecution of the two gardeners uh, under, under the ordinance. And again, I think that showed not only that the movement was willing to defend and make enforcement costly, um, but it also revealed this legal loophole that permitted gardeners to adapt their machinery in ways to get out of the law's grasp. And so that, combined with the effective organizing, pressured city council not to revisit the ban, uh, to reduce the penalties, and really allowed the gardeners to declare victory ultimately in non-enforcement. Uh, the final lesson that I wanted to raise is that um, and this is one that really came home to me personally by my involvement in the campaign, was that lawyers are really most effective when they are working with an organized movement in the lead. So the legal strategy, I think, in the Garment campaign was to coordinate the legal aspects of the movement with the political strategy in ways that really proved very powerful and ultimately successful. So the one uh, coda to the story that I wanted to, to, to include was that after the ban had been defeated, um, organizers tried, uh, took to trying to build economic power in the industry by having gardeners join together to build this collective business enterprise. And the theory was to give gardeners, a, gardeners as a group more bargaining power in the industry relative to homeowners, while also creating a mutual support system that would protect gardeners from falling on bad times. So my legal clinic at UCLA in the very first year that it was created worked with the gardeners to develop a legal plan for a worker-owned business and ultimately helped to incorporate that business as uh, Victor mentioned as a limited liability company under California law. And again, the idea was to convert their, their political success uh, in the campaign into sustainable economic success over time by formalizing their legal structure. Like in the political phase of the campaign, uh, this was a process of lawyers really listening to the gardeners, figuring out what they wanted, and then helping them to achieve that economic plan through this process of legal structure. And it really f highlighted for me not only the good that lawyers could do at helping solidify the organizing games that were already made, but also how the law school and the university more broadly could serve as a resource in supporting this kind of work. So my students spent countless hours uh, on this project in ways that I think really shaped the kind of lawyers that they ultimately aspire to be. So these campaigns not only help the workers, which is obviously foremost, but they also may have these additional benefits, I think, of building the next generation of activists and activist lawyers. Um, so, lessons. Now, um, I wanted just to, uh, to leave off with a few questions, if I might, about the campaign that, again, really struck me when I was thinking about it and reading through it today. Um, one of the questions that came to my mind was, how should we understand success? So there's talk about documenting thinking about the impact of the gardening campaign, the gardener's campaign, on the broader uh, trajectory of immigrant worker organizing in Los Angeles. How do we think about success in these organizing campaigns? So in the gardener's case, I think the outcome was non-enforcement of a very punitive law, uh, a rescission of the most punitive aspects of the law from, uh, from the ordinance. Uh, and that was a good thing. But success was judged in part against a negative legal starting point of this very regressive ban in the first instance. So similarly, if you think about the day labor campaign, success uh, came to be defined and oriented around knocking out a very regressive anti-solicitation ban and thus restoring day laborers to the rights that everyone else has to seek work. 
Um, so by responding to these types of very punitive laws, the horizon of what counts as success may be circumscribed. We generally aren't talking about organizing here to raise wages and working conditions, but rather uh, the protection of the minimal, minimal right to work in the first instance, right? Something that we all normally take for granted. So question about success. Then, then another question is, uh, how, how much is success about uh, individual organizing uh, campaign of the gardeners, the success, the effectiveness of the individual organizing campaign of the gardeners, their ability to organize, mobilize resources, versus sort of broader political changes that were happening in LA at the time, right? So uh, this is happening at a time in LA political history in which labor is getting more power. Um, Reardon's still mayor, but there's a shift underway from Reardon to Han to ultimately to Villaraigosa, to shift in city council. How much is this about internal organizational capacity of the Gardner's movement and the effectiveness of the organizing strategy, which was important, um, versus or in conjunction with the sort of an outsider or structural story about political changes creating opportunities? Uh, the third question, and I'll just, have to, I'll just end up with one more, is um, what are the legal and political stakes, I, I guess I would say, of framing these kinds of campaigns and work like gardening or day labor as entrepreneurship as opposed to labor, right? As, uh, as, a, as about uh, immigrant, worker, immigrant owners of businesses as opposed to immigrant workers as laborers. Um, one frame for the campaign was that it was about, and I think Alvaro mentioned this in his presentation, uh, one frame of the campaign was that it was about supporting immigrant entrepreneurialism, sort of part of the core value of the American dream, who could be against that? I think the positives of framing campaigns like this around the concept of entrepreneurialism are that you create political sympathy, you focus on the ways in which immigrants are creating economic value, um, not competing for jobs against American workers, paying taxes, etc. However, I think there's some tensions with the broader goals of creating solidarity and enhancing protections for low-wage workers. So let me leave you with an example from my own work in my clinic this year, where uh, we worked on a project in connection with Victor, of course, um, uh, focused on developing worker-owned cooperatives for immigrant workers, in which one of the legal issues was ensuring that members of the cooperatives are treated like owners of a business, like entrepreneurs, instead of like workers for the purposes of federal immigration law, because federal immigration law says that businesses can't hire undocumented workers. So cooperatives that want to be, uh, the, the, so I immigrant workers who are undocumented who want to start businesses um, have to fit into the category of being understood by the law as owners and not employees. Um, so in this project, we're working really hard to show um, how owners of a cooperative are not considered employees in the eyes of the law, specifically in the eyes of immigration law, but that also means um, that they're not considered employees in the eyes of employment law, uh, things like application of minimum wage and overtime, which Alvaro mentioned in his presentation. Um, so one question or one concern is that in the short term, we might be solving a legal problem around immigration law uh, by framing what these uh, immigrant workers do as entrepreneurship and ownership instead of work. But in the longer term, we might be undermining the scope of employment law for workers in positions where they are both workers and owners at the same time. So how do we navigate that particular problem? Last, um, how important is it to align workers' rights in environmentalism was the last uh, question that came to my mind when I, when I thought back about this campaign and think about its links to current campaigns around uh, uh, things like uh, poor truckers. So the ordinance passed as an expression of environmentalism as against workers' rights, That's, but that was how it was framed. But then it went into dormancy once the environmental issue was mitigated to some extent by the shift to cleaner fuel, the methanol and not the gas. And uh, the, the qu question I, I, I want to end with is just how important is it for future campaigns around immigrant worker organizing to find that point of intersection to build bridges between immigration and labor on the one hand um, and environmentalism on the other. So I'll end uh, there and thank you and thank you for having me. Thank you, Scott. That was uh, brilliant. Felt like I went to law school for about 30 minutes. He, this is a brilliant example of why um, I, I believe 
that those of you who are undergrads should pursue law, should pursue your graduate degrees for the public interest, <coughs> to do good with, with the graduate degree, to do good with the, with the law degree. It's an excellent example, not just in terms of the presentation, the preparation, the legal arguments, but also to be in a position and the capacity to help other people in need. Because too often the, our interaction with a lot of immigrants, their interaction with, with the law is a negative one. Just last week there was an article about lawyers in the clinic here at UCLA helping uh, street vendors and how they're being cited, how their goods are being confiscated, they're being treated like if, like if they're a criminal, like a common criminal, like they're selling drugs or crack or, or you know, gun possession and things of that nature. So it takes lawyers to come and talk to them. Not just talk to them <coughs> in English, but talk to them in Spanish too. Which Scott did, you know, he was being from San Diego, spoke to the Caribbeanos in better Spanish than mine, so I want to take some Spanish lessons from him after the law lessons. Okay, we're going to continue with Adrian Alvarez, uh, and in a, in a few minutes, um, Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones will, will um, pay us a visit and, and he'll give a talk as well. I'm glad I'm going before uh, Juan Gomez Quinones. Um, we used to call him God. Yeah. <laughs> Juan Gomez Quinones was God. Uh, he's not here yet. Yeah, he's um, coming. Really is glad it's coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was scary. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, the first thing, like everybody, is to thank people. Um, and I do want to thank Scott before it's a little bit of uh, still kissing ass, because, <laughs> but it's needed. But it's genuine. Social movements, if we're confronting the law, unless we have a popular army and we can, sur can surround the city hall, we need to work with the system. We need to work with politicians. And we can't win without lawyers. We can't. And we all know the, the, the jokes about lawyers, you know, like, what do you call a thousand lawyers in the bottom of the sea? You guys know the answer. A, a good start. Uh, you know, and lawyers like Scott are very rare. There's, it's not just that the, the willingness to help, okay, but the intelligence to help, okay, the, the know-how to how to do it. You know, there's not that many people are willing to help but sometimes, sadly, people that are willing to help, they're not good enough to help. Okay, so in Scott's case, we had everything. You know, we had the heart, the willingness, the know-how, and you know the the harmony of of you know how to relate to a movement without being hierarchical, you know, without being uh, imposing, and and truly promote a democratic interaction, you know, at all levels and. I really got to think, I mean, it, it, we need more people like him. Everybody else, like Victor, well, we're, we're compañeros and we're still friends. When you join the movement, it is kind of like uh, Al Pacino uh, in the awful third, you know, uh, Godfather movie. But I think that's the only best scene in that movie because, like, you know, they keep drawing me back. Uh, once you join the movement, you can't escape. You can't. Uh, you're stuck in the movement forever. And Alvaro, uh, Victor, and I start, Professor Quinones, saludos. Uh, you know, you can't get out and you're crazy enough, you know, to keep getting involved. Like right now, we're about to embark on a campaign to defend the street vendors. And we're gonna run into each other again uh, because that's, that's what we do. And interestingly enough, uh, many of the things that were learned in the Garner's campaign will become very helpful in, in the struggle to uh, you know, liberate the, the street vendors. And a lot of the veteranos like us will be there you know, with this uh, experience. So the struggle continues. So thanks to everybody. Uh, Alvaro, you know, I don't use, Mexicans, we don't use the word friend, you know. Like, that's not a Mexican concept, but uh, like friends, it's a given. Like all your friends are your best friends, uh, but we are kind of like best friends. And time can go by, 
it's weird, you know, like time can go by, but, but we talk to each other, it's like we just done talking like about half an hour ago, and we pick it up, you know, right where we left. And lastly, it's very interesting to me that we're talking here because I know you can't tell, but I've been in a couple of hunger strikes. Um, you know, just that I come back with a vengeance. Uh, but we also have to struggle in hunger strike to, one, uh, found the Chicano Studies Research Center. Uh, it was a fight, it was a struggle. It was a struggle so that you know, kids like Oscar here can open up a book and see themselves reflecting in history. It was a struggle even so we can have our own food in the cafeteria. You know, when I was a kid, I had to uh, smuggle, sneak in uh, un chile so I can eat it with a sandwich, you know, because it was oppressive to eat uh, cheeseburgers and grilled cheese without chile. You know, like, so even for that, we had to fight. You know, when I was growing up, I would turn on the TV and Batman is white, Superman is white, Wonder Woman is white, Everybody, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, everybody was blue-eyed and white, and it's unavoidable for a child to see himself in the mirror and say, "Well, I don't got blue eyes, I don't got light skin, so what am I? I'm, I'm worthless." And like the only cartoon that we had was uh, Speedy Gonzalez, a rat. You know, that's <laughs> that's all that we deserved. So even for that, we had to fight. You know, so we fought for the Chicano Studies uh, Center to exist. And, and to serve it, its function, which was, as far as I'm concerned, that we needed to have the experience like the gardeners, you know, our historical experience of struggle, to be put at the service of activists fighting real struggle so that it didn't become some esoteric study, you know, it's, uh, uh, important studies, but nonetheless, it doesn't connect to real struggles. So this is very important. You know, we come the full circle, we were the ones I was telling, uh, I got Madre de Lenox aquí, están organizando en, en, en Lenox with the whole issue of education. And I'll, talk, I'll come back to that right now, like how it's connected you know, with these things with the gardeners. But I was telling them, there's not a single spot here in this campus that we didn't protest. We literally protested in every building, in every corner here for you know, the rights that sometimes we take for granted. So I'm glad to be here speaking now you know to try to put some of the experience some of the theory back into the hands of people that want to become young jedi masters and take on the empire okay all right so let's let, let's let's begin with with the whole question of uh you know the the campaign to organize uh the gardeners the first thing you know i'm just going to randomly say you know some things that i consider important for now and hopefully like victor said somebody or somebody you know, take interest in furthering the, the documentation and the research. And there's a lot, a lot that we haven't even touched upon. But one thing that I want to say is that we didn't organize gardeners. You know, we didn't organize workers. We organized people, okay? We saw gardeners as people, as families, as people with wives and children with real stories and real struggles. The, the fact that we bumped into this struggle by accident, you know, none of us were gardeners. I mean, my mom was, you know, a farm worker, my dad was a construction worker, but we ourselves were the children of, of immigrants that somehow managed to filter, you know, through all the things that prevent us to reach in higher education. And, but we landed you know, this gig of working with the gardeners by accident. And when we first got a call, you know, through a friend, we said, well, let's take him to uh, the SEIU. Let's take him to the ILWW. Let's take him to AFL-CIO. We're not, we don't organize workers, we organize students. You know, we don't know what to do with real, uh, real people that, that work, that don't live in, in this uh, fantasy concentration camp that's the university, okay? Uh, so we didn't know what to do. And we went and, and asked. And what we realized pretty fast is that nobody was willing to organize the gardeners because of the fact that, you know, you don't have a building 
where they all gather, you can't have a contract with one boss. They're unorganizable from the point of view of traditional labor unions. So we ended up organizing. We were too young and dumb to understand that you can't organize the gardeners. You know, you can't do it. And it's the same situation right now with, uh, for example, there's no union, but, but parents dealing with you know, the charter movement that's taking away uh, quality education for the kids. Nobody's organizing parents to defend themselves, to, to fight back. So we, people like us, are the crazy people that end up saying, okay, well, let's see what we can do here. Because you can't collect dues. Many unions say, well, you know, they're undocumented, so we can't organize them. Or they're, they're not willing to, to pay dues. So when we organized gardeners, we, we weren't asking for documents. You know, we weren't asking for how long you've been working. We weren't asking. We just dealt with people, you know, for, and, 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 and that was uh, why we didn't stop organizing them because we said, well, they can't pay dues. You know, well, so what? So let's just organize. Later on, they themselves suggested that we pay dues. And that's an interesting thing we can talk about in, in the reasons you know, why they, they, they decided that we should pay dues. Because being workers, they, they thought that that's the way you separate people that are serious from people that are just playing around. So, so you know, you, if you pay dues, you, you're going to keep in the organization people that really want to participate. It was their idea. It wasn't our idea. And, and, and they, it, it turned out that, that they were right. Okay. Uh, the other thing I, uh, I want to say is one thing that is awkward to talk about these things like Alvaro was mentioning is that when we write about something that we partook in, and so it's kind of weird and sometimes it's difficult to talk about it because how do you know you're not being arrogant? You know, how do you know that you're not being uh, overestimating yourself or, or not understanding the role that you play? Well, my role in this struggle, I was the leader. Of, of, of that struggle but what does that mean you know we need to we need to talk about because leadership it, it, it means many things to many people but for one thing you know my leadership or our leadership wasn't like in a pyramid you know so it's more difficult to see leadership when it's, it's horizontal you know when it's truly committed to a democratic process but I think it would be a lie I think it, 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 it wouldn't do good to the movement not to address the question of leadership. Because even though it's subtle, even though it's democratic, even though it's ethical, but there is leadership and it does play an important role. Okay, it does play, and that needs to be addressed, and I'm not gonna be the one to talk about it. But it should be addressed. Um, all I can say about that is that I'm a long hair dude, I'm short, uh, I have a beard. There's, from the point of view of somebody from Jerez, Zacatecas, or from Nochistlan, Zacatecas, you look at somebody like me, and we were a lot younger, well, there, there are conceptions about who you are. You know, you smoke weed, uh, you listen to rock and roll, they listen to Antonio Aguilar, you, you dress differently from their point of view, you're not a man, you know, the way that they, 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 they have all these, these conceptions. But I think it's interesting how somebody like me or people like us, I ended up becoming the president of the Association of Latin American Gardeners. It says a lot about what you can overcome. It says a lot about, at heart, you know, what lies at this struggle. That there is some commonality that, that we can get in touch with that allows us to transcend this initial superficial differences that we have. You know, so the excuse that, you know, we're not from the same region, you know, we don't speak the same, we're not the same age, we're not the same generation, ethnic or whatever, it's, 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 it's very superficial. I think if you're ethical, I think if you really uh, are seriously there to not get pity, you know, but to be in solidarity, in, uh, in an equal footing, and then people uh, accept you. And then you become, you know, even, it sounds funny, but one of them, you know, so like, 
you, you get integrated into that and then you forget that it, it, it got to a point where I didn't see the difference between us and them. We, it was just us, you know, it became us. So that, that's also important. And also the way we organize, and, and Valo mentioned it a little bit, and you guys will laugh, but it's true. I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard in a movie or somewhere somebody said that in some Arab uh, communities in Arabia or in the Muslim world, that there are some tribes where they have a tradition when you discuss something that you discuss it uh, sober and then drunk. Like you need the you need the both the both to really to to reach an agreement. I I heard that uh, Diego Rivera was talking about you know if Stalin and Trotsky had drank together, they would have become friends. And there is a lot of truth to that. I don't know if that's true in the case of Trotsky and Stalin, but the, you would have resolved it differently. And what, I'm, what, what a lot of important meetings take place at quinceañeras, they take place at weddings, they take place, you know, I'm not making an excuse for myself, but in restaurants, and, and they're always offering you food, and, and you want another plate, and, and, and all these things. That's where a lot of the important discussions and, and, and where the bonding and, and the ideas come from. Okay, so the setting where you do it is important. You know, if you get stuck that, all right, you know, the, for example, we didn't stick to every Monday we're going to meet, or every Tuesday, or the eternal questions like, should, be, should it be at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock? You know, and people get stuck in that. So we know that, for example, that no matter what you do, uh, what you decide, people will always be late. That's just a fact. Like, okay, it, so we never started at a time. We started when, okay, I think we can start now, okay. So we never got caught up in... You know you're late. You know why you're late. You know stuff like that. And then we soon realized that if you're going to call a meeting, because gardeners, and this is an important point, they have a saying. They say, you know, we work uh, desde que canta el gallo hasta que llora el grillo. From when the rooster sings to when the cricket cries. That's how we work. And and when they work, you know, bottle probably will mention later in, in, in the article, is they work, most gardeners work from Monday through Saturday. Now, if you're the one that owns the equipment, if, if there are any Marxist leaders, you know, any Marxist people, the means of production, okay, uh, then you're like on the top tier. And then there's the guy that has a license, okay, he's the one that drives around and drives people and picks people up. And then at the bottom is the nephew or cousin that just arrived. And he does like the manual labor and all that. But if you're working Monday through Saturday, it's on Sundays when you make a little bit of money for yourself. So they really work seven days a week because on Sundays you go and do your own job. You know, you pick up a little work and, and that's yours. And you don't tell the wife that, you know, you got a little bit of money and, and they always have cash, okay? so. The point is that when you're going to have meetings, time is important. When do you have the meetings, how long you have the meetings, and why you have the meetings. One thing you cannot do with gardeners, as with a lot of people, is send them back with a sense of, I wasted my time. You know, there has to be a good reason for them to be there, because they are wasting their time. It's valuable time. So, for example, we would have to consider the, the meanings is Mexico playing, is Chad is going to fight, is it Dia de la Virgen de Guadalupe. We have to consider all those things to have a successful meeting. We learn quick, no meanings when Chavez is playing right, or fighting. You know, that's just not going to happen. So those kind of things uh, uh, allow us to have, you know, successful, uh, successful meetings. And, and food, it should be a, a, a chapter. Food is very important in organizing. Have good food and people will come back to your meetings, okay? Have good food, and don't make it a, a, a serve yourself. Don't make it a, you know, serve people. Serve people, give them the food, make them feel welcome. Make them feel like it's not just a place where we're gonna dis discuss politics, it's a place where, you know what? I don't mind spending my Sunday here with, with these people, with this crowd, because that's what it became. 
you were looking forward to me um, with the gardeners. I hate most Latino movies. I hate most Chicano movies. Okay, I watch them because I need to back them. You know, I need to back them up. You know, they're my friends. They make the movies. Uh, I don't say it publicly. This is the first time I say it. But the reason I say it is because they really glorify. Uh, they romanticize. I hate this child. You know, salt of the earth uh, thing they got about us. So when you look at the gardeners, I I don't like like you know, they're not like the indigenous wise dude that knows you know by looking at the sun when you should plant the. You know, it's not like that. Our meanings were fun. They're, they're, they're very funny, they're very humorous. You know, it's, we drank, we laughed. And a lot of the ideas of what happened as far as the creativity in our events came from the gardeners themselves. So for example, who would have come out, you know, who would have came out with the idea of, hey, I have an idea, let's march barefooted, you know, for three miles uh, to City Hall. Well, some gardener came up with that idea, and I go, snap, man, I haven't walked, you know, without shoes since I was in Sinaloa when I was five. Okay, so all right. But there was some good reasoning behind that. So look, man, if they, if they take our leaf floor, we're going to end up shirtless and shoeless. We're going to be poor. And if that's what they want, then let's give them that. Say, hey, wait, wait, that that's a good idea. And, 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 and the reporters, and, you know, they like visuals, so that's a good visual. So we went with things like that, you know, and, and, and the ideas were generated in, in those uh, celebrations, in those meetings. Now what happened at, in most meetings, just for people that are taking notes on how to organize, you have to be, to be committed to a democratic process, you have to have patience. You have to have patience. One thing about our people, especially from Zacatecas, I think, in Michoacán, they like to repeat things a lot. <laughs> like, they repeat it over and over and they're like, yeah, 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 okay, we went over that. And then they repeat it over and over. And democracy is a way, way slower. Manipulating people is way, way faster. Okay? Deceiving people is way, way faster. Democracy is very, very slow. But it's the only way that you can really get the type of movement that is truly needed, you know, that it's truly based, you know, in the community, in the grassroots, and that it's truly, you know, where we eliminate the leadership and membership that they in us, like that's the only way that it can happen. And it is kind of like a Maoist thing too. I mean, we're not fighting any wars, but it is like, you gotta integrate yourself to the community. So for example, you know, if, if you're gonna be working with people from uh, Zacatecas, well, you're gonna have to eat nopales a lot. You know, you have to eat like whatever they offer you. You gotta eat. You know, you're not gonna organize people say, "No, oh, man, I don't, I don't need that." <laughs> okay, and I know I'm not defending myself, but say, you know, here's, you know, drink with me, but you gotta drink. You know, that those are the things you gotta do to integrate yourself and create that trust that we're talking about. You know, to be able to communicate. Um, the other thing is. Um, One thing that I think that was important as far as what came from the gardeners, and, and I'm glad that Scott was elaborating on it, the idea of the methanol, okay, and what constitutes a victory. The, the, the idea came that, you know, the law says that our gasoline power leaf floor is what the law bans. And some people, you know, were having those discussions and eating and drinking, say, well, what if they're not gasoline? You know, what if, what if we operate with a different, uh, what am I looking for? Uh, fuel. 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 And again, wait, wait a minute. Hey, is that possible? Can that be done? And then we ask uh, one of the manufacturers, yeah, you have to just like drill a little hole and it can be done. And then we consulted with, you know, the, the legal team and say, well, you know, would that work? And we challenge them. And that became, you know, in essence, what ended up defeating uh, the city. And I think what needs to be mentioned as far as what constitutes a victory, and i never forget this because it was Jackie Goldberg that came to our tent uh, during the hunger strike when they realized that we were serious, okay? And then we had discussions after that. 
in, in all seriousness, Mike Hernandez, you know, I, I, we like to joke a lot. Uh, he was at one point, like, he did become, like, the champion. He did. Irrespective of everything else that you might have against him, or he did at one point become, like, he was helping us, you know, to, to try. Huh? The LA Times did an article at that time. Uh, it was so memorable, it just stuck in my mind. But at the, by the way, class of '87. Mm -hmm. um, this guy, this jardinero, got up. Out of, he came out of nowhere, and it's up like a myth. I tr did the research. I tried to locate this guy. Apparently, he came in with a battery from a car. Yes, he did. And he, he whipped that thing up, and it was silent. Okay, let me give you a story because it's a fascinating story. Um, but before, what's his name? Uh, so I can finish that thought. Um, oh, Jackie Goldberg. She came and later on we was decided to go methanol. We consciously sent a group of gardeners using methanol leaf blowers to decide it so that we can challenge the, in the court. After a couple of cases, you know, the, the lawyers can, you know, give me the right words, but they say, well, you know what? We're not going to take these cases no more because they're losing. We made it difficult for them because the police had to confiscate the leaf floors. You had to do some kind of test to prove it wasn't gasoline, there was methanol. So it was an enforceable law. So the message as far as victory that came directly from the politicians like Jackie Goldberg is, look, it, we can't take the law away. You know, that's an impossible fight. It has to stay because otherwise they're going to give you a real hard fight. But you have won because the law is unenforceable. So accept victory. So for us, we did win because it, it, it was true, the law was unenforceable. So for us, it was a victory because you might ask, well, they still find people. It, it, no, they couldn't. We were winning. So this, the, the policemen say, you know what, like, it's not worth it. And also, you know, the policemen didn't want to deal with this with this, this issue. You know, a lot of policemen didn't have a problem with it. So all those things help. But as far as what you said, it, the when we were having the, the, the meetings and rallies at City Hall, a lot of people came. They were watching the news. So this guy, he's, he was a Salvadorian uh, pilot. And interesting enough, he was a contra. You know, he had been like a... He was working like uh, for the government, uh, kidding people with her. But okay, so he shows up and he goes, you know what? Uh, my dad was a pilot. We worked on planes. I know how to fix planes. If you give me a leaf floor, I will make it electric and I can make it sign. And it was like that kind of environment and that kind of trust where I asked, I don't remember what garden it was. I said, hey, you have like enough leaf floor you can lend this guy? And he seemed kind of, you know, quirky and goofy. and. And so we gave him the leaf floor and we forgot about him. Like a couple of weeks later, he returns with a leaf blower. He, he, he fixes it in his garage. He had like a, a car battery. And not only was it silent, then he also realized that, you know what, with the heat and all that, it would throw steam and, and, and then it would convert to water. So it would throw water so there's less dust, you know, coming out. So, he invented a, a machine like that. And I think, in my opinion, you, you can cut that off because I don't be in, in court, but I think that a company stole his idea. Well, okay, and I did a patent search. Hmm? Uh, and uh, there is a company in Pasadena that uh, has developed the technology already. Uh, the biggest, I don't know what the camera is, is this the university or is this the LA Times? I don't know. University, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, there's approximately two patents yeah. currently okay. um, registered with the federal government. Um, one of the companies is in pa uh, Pasadena or um, Monrovia. Aeronomic. Aer yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys. And uh, also there's a separate patent currently uh, <laughs> okay, I think so, it's European, but I'm not 100%. Yeah. Well, I think it's a European. Just so I can wrap it up and, and have, uh, you know, Professor Quinones come up here. Yeah. Um, I do think that they, they stole his idea because I did warn him. They offered to buy it. They offered to buy it. 
and I said, you know what, sell it because you don't have the money kind of lawyers to beat them once they decide to take it. And he didn't listen to me. Okay, so let me. Yeah. Uh -huh. go, go. He wants you to talk about. Okay. Can't say no to Professor Quinones. Okay. <laughs> okay. Feel, free, uh, feel free to engage also. Yeah. This is okay. a good time because we have a, we have a half an hour. So feel free okay. to engage. Well, this, by the way, just to let you guys know, uh, a year before that, we did this battle in Pasadena. My dad's a Harvard-Pinero in Pasadena, and he could, uh, they got a PR company, uh, a bunch of Apple Ness starters. Uh, at the time that my dad had joined in with the Japanese, they're very slick, they got the PR company, they're also starters. This is coming from the second generation. Yeah. Second generation of Japanese farmers, educated in Japan, uh, they couldn't uh, become professionals in this country because uh, you know why, uh, and so they managed in Pasadena. Excellent, excellent landscape. Yeah, let me say something about that real quick. Um, okay, uh, you get my watch. Okay. Um, just real quick, because you mentioned the Japanese gardeners. One thing that was interesting to me was the, the obvious fact that they were becoming extinct as far as a force in, in the gardening, you know, cardinero, not gardening, right? Like cardineros to, you know, the labor part of it. But they were, nonetheless, there were about three, four, five Japanese gardeners that initially were involved in this struggle. But the thing that was very apparent is that and I don't want to stereotype, I don't know if I can make uh, a, a generalization, but in the ones that were there, the main division that prevented us from continuing together is as far as confronting the system, confronting the city hall, they were more accommodationists. They were very afraid of making any kind of uh, noise or demand on the governments, they thought that the way to do it was, you know, to be extremely diplomatic, polite, and all those kind of things, so they themselves began to, to separate. Well, they were uh, camps, you know, the families came from camps and they were, you know, nuked. No, yeah. Okay, so we'll get back to that, but yeah, all those things influenced just the way that we approached it. And so going back to some of the questions that, that were raised, uh, as far as you know, what constitutes a victory and what other kind of gains happen as a result of, of, of this campaign. I think the other thing that is very important and difficult to, to document and perceive unless you met people before and after. But one of the things that also became part of the narrative, part of what we were trying to instill as leadership amongst you know the gardeners that that were joining was that the gardeners were invisible you know it, 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 you had the situations and they continued to happen where even people that consider themselves good people progressive people uh, had been employing a gardener for 35 years but they didn't know the name they didn't know the name of the gardener or they were still paying that gardener the, the same salary that they were paying them 30, 40 years ago. And as soon as the garner, you know, asked like, can I get a $10 raise or whatever, you know, they would get fired. So the, the you, in, in LA, you drive around and you see, you know, LA, it, it, it's, it's famous for its lawns, but the jardineros are invisible. You know, not even the employees themselves see them. Okay, they, they're like, they're not there, they're like ghosts, right? So part of what we did was to instill, it was a little bit like black pride and say it loud, you know, I'm brown and I'm proud kind of thing is, you know, we are people, we do, we do exist, we do have dreams, we do have aspirations. So one of the tactics that we will use when we we're trying to get people to understand who the Garners was is to show them playing baseball, to show them in their traditional celebrations, you know, some people dancing in their, in their uh, ancestral ways, you know, people having kids that uh, are graduating from high school. So th there are people in, I think the, the Time Magazine cover got it right, it's a, it's, it's, an, it's a secret force. 
you know, it's there, everybody has them, everybody sees them, but somehow they just vanish into the background as if, you know, they don't have any, any kind of uh, needs, rights, and things of the nature. So the garners that when, when we run into each other, then now there's a sense of pride. There's a, there's a sense of, you know, we are somebody. We do exist. People took notice of us. We stood up, we fought, we defended ourselves. And that pride, it gets translated to the children. You know, it, it, it gets passed on to the children, to, uh, to, to the way they relate themselves in society. So now they start saying, you know what, why do we settle with just being a, a gardener? Why can't we become landscapers? You know, why can't we have our, our own uh, nurseries? So now we were seeing beyond that. And just to address that real quick, what began initially as an effort to help people to get rid of an oppressive law, and I know it sounds like we're just trying to be, uh, you know, exaggerating using words like oppressive, but think about this. And I, I was, because we have to deal with so-called small claim courts. If you're rich, well, what, what small claims? What is it, what's the, the amount of money? 500. 500 or 5,000, I think? Yeah, 5,000. It's 5,000, I think. Okay, well, that's small claims, but to whom? Mm -hmm. Man, if you make less than minimum wage, $5,000 might as well be a million dollars. How is that small claims? You know, people kind of lose track of just because it doesn't seem like a significant amount of money to some people, uh, to other people, you might as well take away their house. So for example, you working, trying to make a living, uh, a cop stops you and they're gonna find you a thousand dollars. I mean, that's, that, that's outrageous. That's like finding somebody that makes, uh, you know, seven thousand dollars a year. You're gonna find him like twenty thousand dollars or something like that. It's like that's 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 insane. Okay, so we have to, you know, keep perspective as to what it, what a dollar means to 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 different people. So even though we're talking about a leaf blower, some people laughed about it. Some people was like, well, you know, what's the big deal with the leaf blower? What what's the big deal? Some people can make a living unless they have that tool. Some people can't feed their children unless they have that tool. And that's, that was part of the things that we had to convey to people, that we had to educate people on, so they understand you know, the level. And politicians, and, and I'm gonna go back to this, when I was getting to the cooperative things, there, there exist like tiers of importance, even in politics, even in progressive circles. So for example, uh, everybody's gonna jump on the bandwagon to let's stop dolphins from getting killed, you know, when you're fishing tuna, right? But there's all kinds of fish that nobody really cares about. Okay, we care about the dolphin for some reason, more than, more than other fish. And it's understandable because, you know, they smile, they seem to be smiling, and, and you saw flipper movies like that. So what I'm saying is, if you go with a politician and say, you know, I'm with the UFW campesinos. Campesinos, who? Everybody wants to know campesinos, right? Because they're like, campesinos kind of became the poster child of who we are as, as a movement. So, you know, Solis, Inta Solis, Villarregosa, everybody independently of their degree of selling out or compromising or forgetting, you know, what, why they got there for, they, they're willing to help out with that. It, it's still politically beneficial as far as you know your credit with the Latino community that you help the the UFW but you come and say hey, you know you want to help uh, street vendors there is no romantic uh, there's very little political gain M many of them don't vote you know they don't have money to contribute to you they're very difficult to organize so who cares about the street vendors they only sell popsicles or, you know, it, it's insignificant. Again, but to you, they're, they're children that depend on that lady selling those delicious bacon wrapped hot dogs to feed a, a child. Okay, give me, I'll wrap it, then we can take the, the question. So my point is, 
when we got to from defeating the law to now the the, the, the garden saying hey we want to own our own nurseries we want to be able to have our own businesses okay so we moved now to a movement that became a mutual aid society you know that was the philosophy that we're promoting mutual aid you know let's help each other to be able to have something like a garner uh, cooperative you know that you have mutually owned equipment you have mutually owned nurseries where you can benefit yourself sell and, and do more things like that with with that effort we almost succeeded but we feel victim of the housing crisis and that I regret and I kick myself in the head you know for not getting involved directly but we bought a house together you know we bought a house together and the idea was to fix it you know because they were landscapers sell it save money sell it again they would buy our nursery and it was beautiful you get there 20 gardeners working the house you know it was like the homage like everybody you know got there in the morning working together and doing everything we fixed it and then okay crashing down and it, it really broke us as far as you know that you know that effort what's the lesson you learned from what from the housing the lesson that I learned is that when you organize you got to want it more than anybody you got to want it even more than the people that invited you to begin with it is a crazy thing where at one point the people themselves get demoralized the people themselves don't want it as much and you realize that what you need to teach and, and this is the things that we're talking right now is not just about informing people it's not just about giving people information you need to motivate people you need to convince people it's people know it's people know see right in mexico where they're killing the cornaleros in san quintin where they're killing the students where they're killing journalists where they're killing honest lawyers everybody everybody know what the problem is but what can you tell these young people that 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 what you have to is not only knowledge that you need to have you need to have heart and conviction and courage and you have to be crazy enough you have to be crazy enough to trust that at the end at the very end just like the movies the good guys win you have to know that the hero at the end will reach the end of the journey and just like the arc of any good hero movie, you will go through everything. Through certain defeat, through demoralization, to why did I do this? Uh, I should have done something else. But you, you, this is, in any campaign that I got involved in, there always appears a way. Something always happens that, out of the blue, gives you a possibility hope that gives you a chance but you got to stay alive you got to stay with it you got to keep going and when that happens then you succeed and victory just to wrap it up and then we can take comments and questions anybody that gets involved in any kind of movement needs to know that and I'm going to plagiarize a great uh, writer that just passed away Eduardo Galeano uh, and I think this is the best way to explain it. Um, when people ask him what, I, what utopias are for, what good are they for, utopias? You know, you can't reach utopias. Utopia doesn't exist. And he answered, utopias are meant to keep us walking, to keep us reaching, to keep us going. The point is not whether we reach our utopia. The point is that we walked. The point is that we fought when it needed to be. 
We stood up when we needed to stand up. We did the right thing when the right thing needed to be done. And we might not get there, but we got to keep walking because what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Okay, the, the fight that's not fought can never be won. Okay, we have to fight even against the odds, even if it seems impossible. I know it sounds not romantic, but that is what I think it really is about. And you have to see the movement as an ethical thing. Really to organize will fall not under political science, not under philosophy, the proper category of organizing is ethics. It's an ethical thing. Either you're ethical or you're not. And when people see that you're ethical, that's precisely the point where they trust you. So thank you. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to make some closing remarks for about 10 minutes. And then instead of having a Q&A at this level, we're going to have a reception and then we can have a, people can ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. I think there's a lot of important questions and, and, and issues that, that we need to discuss here. Uh, and I know some of you uh, arrived uh, halfway through the presentation. And if you email me, uh, I'll just send you the, the PowerPoint presentation that uh, that was that was done in the first half of the of the presentation. And this will be done in a couple of weeks. And, it, and it'll be done in a, a videotape of this uh, very professional videotape on YouTube on Chicano Studies Research Center has a YouTube channel uh, will be available. Let me just say this: uh, Jardineros uh, are important uh, service. They, they pro perform an important service you know, to, to the economy. They're not recognized for it. Uh, they are the true environmentalists. But instead, in, in Hollywood, they're, they're ridiculed. Uh, Jaime Aleman, who's the, one of the co-founders of the of Alagla, and is the one that coerced Adrian and I to, to get involved, and we didn't even know what we were getting involved in. He, uh, he wasn't able to be here today because he couldn't get a worker, and he only has so many clients. And because of the drought, he, those clients that he has are, are decreasing. Uh, so it's important that, that we know, you know the day-to-day -day issues that, that these workers uh, you know, participate in. The presentations that, that Victor Nato uh, delivered you know, were excellent because he gives, a, gives us insight into the institutional organization that advocate for immigrants, but at the same time we need to be critical of them in terms of some of their positions. You know, like Maldef has always been a, a, an excellent organization that advocates for the rights of immigrants, uh, Latinos in general, but when it comes to particular issues, they, they just didn't get it. They dropped the ball. A lot of the labor movement, like Adrian was talking about, Adrian and I literally went door to door. Uh, I mean, we ended up having a little bit of support later on with the late Miguel Contreras because we knew Fabian Nunez, the former Speaker of the House. And even then, you know, it was a token of a $500 donation to the cause. And only when they saw us mobilizing 500 people in the streets, 1,000 gardeners, 2,000 gardeners in front of City Hall did, did they respond. Now, the leadership was, was politically savvy. We could have had 1,000 gardeners in their trucks circulate around City Hall. We could have done that, but we didn't do it because we knew it, the public would turn on you. you. You disrupt somebody's job and they'll turn on you. So we're, we're savvy in, in those in those ways. So what do we do? Like Adriano was saying, we march barefoot. Not just march barefoot from anybody, from anywhere, but the Department of Social Services to City Hall. I actually have my uh, calcetines on, just that was kind of said. But besides that, we were symbolized, trying to symbolize this idea that here we are conservatives, Americans, American leaders, that talk about immigrants as taking jobs, that talk about them being lazy, but when you have one of the most hardest working groups in the United States being penalized for trying to make a living, then there's something wrong with that. So we have to demonstrate through, through, through 
political theater. Now, the, the role of leadership is important. There's people that are very romantic about the people, about working people. Working people by themselves cannot lead a, a movement. By themselves, they can't. It's impossible. Because they don't have the resources, the time to study law. They don't have the luxury of time to study other movements. It's no coincidence that all of the important movements throughout history have been led by university educated individuals. Like Marcos with the Zapatistas is the university professor. You have Ho Chi Minh, he studied in France. You have Mao Zedong, Lenin, all of these revolutions that educated individuals because through their education, they've had the luxury to study history, to study other movements, to learn from them. And all of the Chicano activists that participated in this movement were UCLA graduates. Mm -hmm. And one of the prerequisites was to take Juan Gomez Quinones. <laughs> Literally, I majored in history, minored in Juan Gomez Quinones. <laughs> and for the first time, you see a Chicano professor for the first time in my life attending a, a unified school district, segregated schools, I always had a white teacher. They were always nice to me. There was, there was nothing wrong. But I never seen anybody that looked like me in a position of power, of authority, with a university education. It wasn't until I attended UCLA and I took Juan Gomez Quinones class. Nobody told me I had to read 10 books. That, that was, that was a, a shock. That was a, a little shocker. <laughs> Since I was only assigned a two-page paper and read one book in my high school. Can I say something? Because I want to say this to the professor. And this is a kind of like a thing. When I first came to UCLA, uh, you know, unfortunately, there was already uh, divisions and opportunism. And you would take some classes with so-called Chicano professors. And by virtue of you smoking weed with them, by, you, by virtue of you partying with them and being cool with them, you could get a good grade. Okay, and in contrast, I don't forget this, and, and I want to thank him for this. I remember the first time I walked into his class on the very first day, what do you guys do in most classes? The very first day, you expect nothing's gonna happen. Right, so like, okay, they're just gonna give the syllabus and, and that's it. So we walk in the first class, and Professor Kiyosa is asking, what, what are, what's your thesis going to be about? Like, oh, snap, <laughs> like that, uh, you know. And uh, we went, and what are you going to do but make up stuff, right? Like, because you, you really didn't think about it. So luckily I was the last one to go, oh, man, I need to think about what am I going to say? But I don't forget one person said, like, uh, I'm going to do it on bilingual education. And Professor Kiyosa said, I'm not going to say the way he said it, but it was more like, what in the hell can you say about bilingual education that hasn't been said already? Okay, meaning like you didn't get a free A with Professor Quinones. You had to earn the A. There was no, you're Mexican and I'm gonna give you an A. And that did happen. I'm not gonna lie to you. I benefited from that too. <laughs> but I think I was right because I would have protested and dude, I can't pass your class, I've been at a hunger strike for seven days, so give me a break, or at least give me a chance to. And luckily some of the professors were cool enough to say, you know, give, but there was no free A's with Quinones. And I think that's, that's really the best thing that ever happened to people like us. Because he knew that for the things that we needed to do and become and the challenges that we were facing, you know, you couldn't, you had to know your stuff, you had to do the research, you had to, be ready for it. So he he's the one that, that taught us, you know, talk is cheap. Okay, you have to back up your stuff and no amount of revolutionary talk is gonna deliver some bread on the table for some workers. At the end of the day, your talk has to deliver something or otherwise it's just talk. So that's just profit. So I think what well, I concur with you know, Everything, everything that was said. And part of the message and part of doing this conference is so that younger people can learn from the successes and failures 
of, of those that came before you. When we were organizing the gardeners, this one a reporter or someone told him, asked me, he goes, what's your model? What, what's your organizing model? Is it a Linsky model? And I was a little puzzled by the question because it implies that there always has to be someone outside of our communities to teach us how to organize. I mean, since our child was taught by, by Ross and others, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But why can't we be taught by our own? And what I told them is that the, the indigenous people of this country have been always resisting. From the conquista to Mexican Revolution to Ricardo Flores Magón, you know, to the Brown Berets, to the Mothers of East LA, to the, the Jardineros. Mexican indigenous people have always been resisting. We don't need to look any we don't need to look anything any further but, but our own past, our own history of resistance to know what, what really matters. But that also has to be balanced with the reality of that you do need to study, you do need to be in a position to study other movements. So I'm not contradicting myself here. What what I'm saying is that we can black people with the Black Power Movement, with Stokely Carmichael, and those, those movements demonstrated that self-determination, being able to, to determine your own future was an important tool. And you don't need outside people because outside people, what they end up doing is they undermine the efforts. And I appreciate what Scott said, as a lawyer, as a lawyer, you work with communities in conjunction where you serve you know, for them. You don't dictate, you know, this is what you do because you disempower them when you do that. So if Adrian and I, as university graduates, come to a meeting and say, well, this is what you're going to do. Oh, that's a stupid idea. We, we went to UCLA. You did it. This is what we're going to do. And could we know what works? It would fail. And even if, even, even if we would win the law morally, ethically, we would fail. Because at the end of the day, it's true with Adrian. It's, it's an ethical issue. But to come to that realization, you need to study ethics. You need to, you need to study philosophy. You need to study you know, the law. So this message is not for me, it's not for Scott, it's not for Adrian or Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones, because we've already been through this, it's for the young generation. And Abby Hoffman once said, you know, don't trust anybody over 30. Luckily I'm 29, so I'm <laughs> So this idea, this movement that we built was not this, based on this charismatic leader, this his, the history that uh, you need a FDR or, or you need a Che Guevara, somebody charismatic leader to lead the way in the peasants, the masses will, will follow. It's not like that. You need both. You need the role of Adrian, the charismatic leader, in service, like the Zapatista, like Marcos, in service of the community themselves. And to listen to what the people say and to incorporate those ideas. We keep talking about the Barefoot March because that, that's a, that's a concrete example that didn't come from Adrian, didn't come from myself or from Antonia Montes who was a Chicana activist, Elsa Polado who was a Chicana activist and another Chicana activist that were involved that came you know from a jardinero and in these type of struggles the, the best way to practice is practice now the reactionary poet Octavio Paz once said that the university represents real actions in an unreal world So when you practice here, organizing, fighting against the administration, this is practice. So when you get out there. I mean, even getting hit by the police is kind of practice, kind of fake, like they hit you with those plastic things. Because when you get out there, that's when the real practice, that's when, that's when it's not just rubber bullets, it's real bullets, right, like what we see in Baltimore. But at the end of the day, it's, it's here, it's you young people, university people, community college people, transfer people, sons of immigrants, first generation, you are the ones that will lead the next movement, the dreamers. I've always argued, and I argue this a lot, that the dreamers represent the leaders of this generation. Just like the freedom riders in the early 1960s with African Americans and whites joined to desegregate the South, the dreamers, the undocumented. I mean, it takes a lot of guts to say I'm undocumented because of the consequences. 
when I go against the government, when I ride against the government, when I ride against Obama deporting over two million people, the worst they can do is deport me. But they're gonna deport me to East LA where I was raised. But for other people, the consequences are great. So for us coming together here and documenting this is to talk about a real story with real people and not to romanticize it and how things really work. And if you wanna work with people, work with them as equals in terms of there's differences. There's always gonna be a difference. We all know that. We all know that somebody's gonna have a law degree, someone's gonna have a PhD, somebody's gonna be a dropout, but at the end of the day, we're all people. You know, my brother is one of the most, the, the most, as far as I'm concerned, the, the most successful Chicano artist of all time, Salomon Huerta. But he's no different than, than my other brother who doesn't have that 50 minute of fame or two hours of fame, whatever. They're all the same. And unfortunately in this society, we're, we're, we're put in these pedestals, right? So like, if you're educated, you're better. If you're a citizen, you're better. You know, so this, these ideas. So for us to, to, to come together and bring these discussions and, and talk about these issues, and you know, we'll have a refreshments and talk when I want, is to send a message that you know, we can do it, we can make change, and it, has, it, starts, it starts from the individual, but it has to be in, in conjunction with other people and, and dealing with and respecting people uh, as equals, as human beings, not, not within these hierarchies that, that we're labeled. So, you want to take questions? I think we're going to do it with the reception because oh. we're supposed to give from three to five. Okay. So, with that, muchas gracias. Thank you, everybody. And we're going to